Yes, welcome to the pilot episode, episode one of the Matt Sager podcast. We're officially doing this. It's about time. That theme music is possibly going to be changed in the future. It's all extremely preliminary at this point. The theme music could change. The title of the podcast could change, although I mean, the Matt Sager podcast is pretty good. It's pretty all-encompassing. It's fairly descriptive, cuts to the point. But um, another thing that could change is the format, and that could bring with it a title change. I mean, you know, if I've got another host or hosts, which, by the way, if you'd like to be part of this, this really is the beginning. Uh, be a part of this show. Help me name it and guide it and steer it and give it a purpose. Uh, contact me. I'm Matt at MattSager.com. M-A-T-T at M-A-T-T-S-A-G-E-R.com. Send me an email or a Twitter. I'm at Matt Sager. Facebook is Matt Sager VO. And speaking of VO, I'm not in the home studio. You may have guessed. Um, I'm doing it from a reasonably high quality room, but since I'm a guy who is primarily a voice actor, it's worth noting that I'm not doing this show from my professional soundproof studio, which is equipped with ISDN lines, so you can direct me remotely and has a very low noise floor, which if you're not into voiceover means nothing to you. If you are into voiceover, it's sort of everything, so it matters quite a lot. But I would like to do things with this show. I would like to give it a purpose beyond just me checking in and catching up with you and getting a microphone fix as a guy who has only ever been a voice actor and radio guy for the most part. I have had other jobs, but if you were to do a PowerPoint of my adult life, 95% of it would involve a microphone in some capacity. Even as a kid, one of the first things I remember as a going to summer camp given basically free reign of the radio station, which I'm sure was a real treat, but it was, for me, very formative. Anyway, uh, the truth of the matter is, this particular podcast I'm launching just because I'm so impressed and so excited to use Anchor. I think Anchor, if people start using it, if more people start using it, if as many people want a podcast as claim they want a podcast, this democratizes the medium in such a dramatic way it's crazy. It is free. Uh, as I said, I'm not in the home studio, but I'm using a decent quality microphone hooked up to my... I happen to have an iMac Pro, but I could be doing this from a, a MacBook easily. And they're taking care of the syndication. They're taking care of the hosting. There are no expenses other than what I've already got. And again, I've got that because... These are basic business expenses for me. So it, it costs me nothing to do this podcast. Anchor is going to do the work of getting it syndicated onto Apple and I think Spotify and Stitcher and wherever you can hear like Joe Rogan and Kevin Smith, you'll be able to hear me. And I think there's absolutely just no excuse for a guy like me who, as I said, I basically got one skill in life. It's talking behind the microphone. It's just obscene for me to be aware of Anchor and to not have a show. So welcome to the Matt Sager Podcast. I hope you had a goddamn good time. And uh, I hope you had a great July 4th. What a weird week. What a weird holiday. What a weird time for a patriotic holiday. Jeez. It's a very interesting time to be an American. Whatever side of the aisle you fall on politically. I mean, there is stuff happening in... God, I swore I wasn't going to go down this route, but how do you not? How do you avoid the elephant in the room that is tearing apart everyone and everything that taints your feeling of patriotism, that makes you feel guilty when you don't always feel patriotic about something your country is doing, makes you fight with your friends and start making friends with your enemies and makes already unpleasant family functions just hell? It's, uh, th there's a shadow over everything. And my political ideology does not mean that it's in any way exclusive to me. Um, someone, just as an example, someone who is a very good friend of mine is a supporter of policies that I find horrifying. 
inhuman. But the goodness of this human being, the kindness that he demonstrates every day, not to me because I like him because he's my friend, although I do and he is, but the work he does to make his family happy, the amount of time he spends thinking about others in comparison to himself, the work he puts in on the part of others for nothing, nothing other than the the motivation he has out of being a good human being, it's hard to reconcile that with some of his opinions just as it's hard for me to see some stuff being shared repeatedly on social media about really stuff that I don't think very few people would argue that it's horrific to see stuff like with what's going on with immigrant kids. It's just... Oh, those who even are able to somehow defend it because of their passion for the administration or just because they hate Hillary that much, even they can't. The guy I was alluding to earlier, he, he, just as I was an Obama fan who found it disgusting what we did with drones, any Trump person who's not working for Trump will tell you that the stuff with kids is horrifying and gut-wrenching and they can't reconcile it. But I do see a lot of stuff being posted and shared by people who I know personally, people who I've got maybe familial ties to in some cases, others who I've worked with recently, others who I share friends with, and those friends have lifelong trauma from their interactions with these people. In other words, people whose lives are spent in large part, around empowering themselves with narcissism and cruelty and just finding a way to compartmentalize in such a way that I'm really not calling anyone out specifically, but there are anyone who's ever worked in radio and probably anyone who's ever worked in any environment will tell you there are humans who are basically sociopaths. Like, they're probably never going to commit a crime But the way they view the world and their role in it is so creepy, so dispersonal, so removed and so centered around themselves that, you know, fortunately, they're never going to become serial killers because they'd be amazing at it. There, There are sociopaths among us, and many of them have views with which I'm very sympathetic politically. But so that's the thing, is that where lines are drawn can be complicated when really, really good people believe in their ideals so deeply that they accept the unacceptable, whereas in polite society and in a society that is not spinning off the rails, that still cares about and is grounded in democracy, you just don't allow certain crimes to be committed, certain atrocities to be committed in your name, even if you as a person are kind of garbage when it's the workday's over and it's time to go home. So what I'm saying is it's complicated, in case you haven't figured that out. It turns out it's a complicated time. We elected a guy, uh, I, 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 we've elected the only president so far who has yelled at me personally more than once. So I knew things were going to get weird. Did not know how weird, did not know how intense, but um, yeah, I have a couple of friends who've got really cute stories about meeting President Clinton before or after or during his time in office or knowing Hillary, and actually my stepdad served honorably in the Carter administration, and lots of my entertainment friends had a run-in at one time or another with either Ronald or Nancy Reagan. I was berated by our commander-in-chief twice that I can think of, both radio-related, both K-Rock-related. One was an event at, I think, one of his properties, and he yelled at me there. He came up from behind me, and there was music playing, and I didn't know I was about to be yelled at by a six-foot-two or six-foot-three guy. So if if you've ever been in a nightclub and had someone scream in your ear, and it's really just unbearable, and you're like, oh, what, what? It was just uh, imagine that, but from 
a very bellicose, very angry, uh, very 90s, so a little bit insecure with the finances, Trump. And then another time, actually, I think at one point he yelled at me because he just was cranky. But uh, for much of the night, he was actually pretty nice. And that was an event that I think had nothing to do with him, was not at any of his properties, um, was not branded with him. And I'm not even sure he was invited. But, you know, in his best and worst times, he was always certainly a major figure in New York and certainly always welcome at those types of events. Who knew, though? Seriously. I think in 1995 or 6 or 7 or whenever that was, if you had pointed to a group of, not really my circle, but the wackiest people I've ever come into orbit with. I said, over there's uh, Matt Pinfield, there's Donald Trump, there's Corey Feldman, there's Wesley Willis. I don't think Donald Trump would have been in the top three of people uh, to expect would one day be the leader of the free world. So again, this is something that I think is probably pretty universal, whether you are not a fan I, I'm going to be honest, I'm not. Or whether you really, really are a fan. I honestly, I know a lot of Republicans. I know a lot of conservatives. I know a lot of people who support the administration because of that. But I don't know any Trump fans. Um, and therefore, it is my conclusion based on, based on the research of a guy who's only done radio. So take it really with a grain of salt. I'm not going to be one of these guys who gets behind a microphone and immediately declares himself an expert. I'm going to be very upfront about this. My research is entirely speculative. It's entirely gut instinct. And I don't mean that in a self-aggrandizing way, the way some people say, I made it up myself. I'm just being upfront with you about my ignorance. That said, I think people from the farthest far right to super crazy left wing uh, share a lot of the same values at the end of the day, which is why it sort of sucks that we do as much fighting as we do. And uh, it's uncomfortable for me being someone who sits in the middle because I'm someone who likes to fly the middle finger and be very opinionated and be very loud. But at a time like this when everyone's throwing Molotov cocktails and many of them are not the right arguments posed in the right way by the right person, and a lot of it is just burning down everything and tearing down civility. In light of that, disregarding for a moment my entire last 10-minute spiel, I'm going to make every effort to just make this about fun and not about the horrific stuff in the world. But because I've got a conscience, there's going to be times when it just happens. Especially if, as I hope, I get a cast in here of voice people, I'd love to hear from you, voice people. I'd certainly love if, among other things, this podcast was voice actor centric. I think we really need a new variety of voice actor show. And since I'm a sort of unique kind of voice actor, I would like to be the guy hosting that show. Uh, but even if it's not, I want voice actors on this show. I want people doing bits with me. And I really want writers. And I want friends and people who want to promote stuff. I want this to be a fun place where we come to have fun with each other. And uh, so speaking of, and speaking of all this horrific nonsense, uh, how was your fourth? Mine was hot. Really hot in New York. I think the fourth was not actually itself that bad. But the week sucked. The week, ugh, it was garbage. Was at one point, I think 104 were under, they're coming up with new names now to try and describe the kind of awful weather we're dealing with. So we were under a heat dome, which is very cool because it sounds like something Stephen King would do. That very good book and terrible TV show, Under the Dome. Er, earlier this year in January, they had a, what do you call it? Uh, they called it the bomb blast or snow blast, cyclone bomb. Yeah, bomb cyclone. That was it. It was like a dangerous beheading Coney Island fun ride, uh, except it was a blizzard. And I had my, the biggest job I've had this year, the biggest job I've had in a long time. I'm, uh, there's not a whole lot I can say about it. And it's not, it's not as big as I'm making it out, but I am going to be in a 
seriously major movie coming out later this year. And as it happens, they scheduled me to shoot the first day of the bomb blast, and I showed up, and because working conditions were unsafe, they kept us there all day and then said, oh, we've just been told by the city we gotta shut down. And they said it in a panicked 1940s-style voice for some reason even though it's a 70s period piece. So they sent us all home and said, just come back in nine days. And literally the, the cyclone blast had done like a 360 whirlwind tour around the world, like, uh, like, like Axl Rose on his wheelchair with the reunited Guns N' Roses and had returned to North America. So that exact day, it's a cyclone blast again. It, the t- two times this year, probably the two times this decade or even century, that it was like more than 15 below and searing wind where like I took my glove off so I could turn the turnstile and get out of the subway and then it was like a three walk block to the set and my hand was numb and swollen. I looked I, I, I looked like that bloated zombie from The Walking Dead that got stuck in the well. Just I, my hand had puffed up and oh, it was horrific. It has been the most irritating day I mean, one of those days where someone should be in prison. I lost a day of my life. Someone should be, a a, a crime has been committed. I've had a day that I'll never get back stolen from me. And no one is behind bars. That's unacceptable. But um, one of the reasons that I always wanted to be a talk show host, the idea that you could entertain people with your frustration, with your pain, that you could walk in with a full head of steam and rage and just entertain people with all of the pain and grief and crap that you've been building up and storing up and or just you've got to let it out or it's going to kill you. I've got a very good friend who is one of the all-time great punk rockers at like 60 or something. He's way up there. He still goes out nearly every night and does these insane shows where he does like 15 slam dances. He's been sued because he's put people in his audience in comas because he rides the crowd so hard. And uh, I've always asked him something along the lines of where do you get the energy? Why do you punish yourself and your audience like this? Where does this come from? And he's almost always said the exact same line to me. He always goes, I'm sweating out the poison. And uh, I guess that's what I'm doing now. I'm sweating out the poison of just a frustrating, frustrating day. Um, And it wasn't any one thing. It was like this awful thing happened. And so I tried to shake it off and walk downstairs. And then something twice as bad happened. It, 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 It was rough. It was a difficult, difficult day. Not leastly because so much of it had to do with doctors and doctor appointments. That shit is so awful and depressing and boring when it's going wonderfully. I mean, doctors save your life and can do all kinds of stuff to make your life better. But it is depressing to be any age over 30 and be in a doctor's office. It's not ideally a place you want to be or a thing you want to do. But what's worse is that medical care is so expensive and good doctors are so hard to come by when you really need one that they kind of hold it over you. Even the best, the most kind-hearted, they, they do, there is a tendency, and some of this is me projecting and just being scared of, oh God, there's only X amount of decent doctors in the world. Please don't leave me. But a lot of them will threaten you with like, listen, if you've got a problem with waiting three hours, if you've got a problem with being double billed, not getting the right medicine, go screw. And if you ask them about it, In a calm setting, they'll say something like, we're doctors, we save lives. You could never judge or understand what we do. You could never. You're not equipped to make a comment on our performance. Our timeliness is based around our ability to save lives and prevent tragedies. And to that I say, all right, so the next time I get booked for a commercial and I show up three hours late and drunk, Am I to say, you don't know what it's like to master breath control and to really get the copy down, not just a little bit, but the nuance, the kind that the marketer wants. You you see what I'm saying? All of life is a skill that you need to learn and master to have a career and contribute to the world. And I agree that it's a billion times more of a contribution to society to be a doctor 
than it is to work with your voice. But it doesn't make you a god. It doesn't make you above reproach. The worst thing that ever happened was that goddamn Dr. House television show. I actually binged it at the time, and I love Hugh Laurie, but fuck that show. Fuck what it did to the idea of doctors. The idea that you've got to be a flaming asshole and, like, em emotionally autistic. I, I, I can't cure this woman's lupus until I finish licking the, the socket while you put a fork in my rectum. It's a test to make sure the left cortex is functioning. It's the only way. Uh, Dr. House, I broke my leg. Shut up! I'm tripping balls right now to cure cancer. It's, you know, the idea that you've got to be aggressively dim-witted and self-centered to help others. It, it, it's a great TV show concept. It's great writing, but had way too much of a cultural impact. It changed the way doctors and patients like me view doctors. But in truth, uh, my situation is not like that. I've got really excellent doctors, and I'm very fortunate in that regard. Uh, the thing is, though, it is hard to get and be able to get in to see a good doctor. It's usually the case that if they're good, they're either impossibly expensive and you can't use insurance, or they're booked 24-7, or they teach around the country so they're not available a lot, or something like that. It's a fine balance if you want to get a good provider uh, for medical care, and you really do. You do not want to go to a crummy doctor. But so I had a long wait to get in and see one of my doctors, like a really super long wait. But it was fine. I dealt with it, got in. It was a great appointment, had a procedure done. It went really cool, and then got on the train to come home. I live in Greenwich Village. And admittedly, I was listening to a uh, Kindle audiobook. If you're interested, I'm listening to the reading of Stephen King's The Outsider. It's an amazing book, and it's an even better audiobook. I recommend both. But I'm on the train home, uh, and for some reason, we skipped the West 4th Street stop and went right to a, uh, I think it was a six-train stop on Canal Street, even though it was an F train. The New York City subways are a mess right now. It should not be a surprise when something weird like that happens and when it happens unannounced. It's been an official state of emergency for, I think, six months. And I know that I said earlier that I was not going to make this a political podcast, and I really am going to try very hard to, to hold to that. But I'm really, really a big booster of Cynthia Nixon, and I think the city needs someone like her desperately. I don't know that she's weighed in on the disaster that is the subway system, but I hope that she has and that she will. And I trust that she'll do something with it. I trust that she'll handle it. And Cuomo, I don't know that he has any fans. I think he's kind of a boogeyman to Republicans. And I know that he's ostensibly a Democrat. He is just, ugh, he, he's just grimy. If, if you Google Cuomo and Ethics Commission, he assembled a committee to look into his own wrongdoings and then neutered them and make sure they couldn't do their job and then did a half-assed job of PR disaster control when word got out about his malfeasance. It, it's just gross. Just screw him. But so then I'm at Canal Street, and I need to get back to my neighborhood because... And now this is where it gets weird and super awkward. Talk about people who are there to make your life better and to make you healthier and who you don't want to be in a disagreement with. Whew. So I've been on a health kick for a while. Starting about a year ago, I got kind of fit and... I don't know. I mean, there, there's a look you have when you've worked behind a microphone and don't care. And then you hit a certain age and go, you know what? I, I want things to go well for me. I want to be more attractive to women. I want to feel better walking down the street. I don't want to ever gasp for air and shit. You know, I quit smoking in 1998. That was for a girl. Um, 
this is not exclusively for that. It's for me. It's, it's so that I don't end up in doctor's offices. It's so that I end up being a, a healthy guy, strong guy, badass looking guy. And uh, uncoincidentally, right after I started it is when I booked the part in the movie that I alluded to earlier. But so now I'm really leaning into it. I'm training. I'm doing personal training three times a week. And I found a fantastic trainer. Just just awesome. Just really got my entire picture, my strengths, my weaknesses that we need to improve, whole ideas about the way I do and don't use my body and the way I eat. Just, just awesome. And then like three sessions in, he shows up 10 minutes late. And I notice that when we end, we end on time because there's an appointment after me. And I go, oh, shit. I hate asserting myself. And I really hate confrontation. I like harmony. I like just being like, hey, you know this stuff that we sort of, these agreements that we entered into, some on paper, some tacitly, some just societal norms. Like, we're all going to agree to those, right? Because then when someone doesn't hold up their end, I feel like an asshole when I go, hey, excuse me, that's my lawn you're stepping on. It's very hard for me to be that guy, especially when the person I'm talking to is A, someone who I really want to be on good terms with because they're going to make me healthy, and B, could murder me in probably 40 different ways using one finger and minimal effort, could murder me, dismember me. So that adds an extra layer of awkwardness. Obviously, that did not happen. Uh, I was not killed in part because I uh, really didn't want to make a thing of it. I didn't want to. I don't like to make a thing out of stuff. Like I said, confrontation sucks. And this guy was helping me in ways that are going to probably affect the quality of my life for the next 50 years. He's going to make them directly better. Uh, but I did say something because I felt it would be better to address it than to fall into that classic trap that you do when you don't like confrontation, where you don't say anything, but you kind of go, ah, oh, I wish I did. And then, God forbid, it happens again, and it's even harder to speak up. But then when you don't, you start to build up this really pointless and toxic and dumb and wrong resentment, which, by the way, the person you're angry at doesn't deserve and you don't deserve. It's almost a form of mental illness where your inability to logically confront, for lack of a better word, is so bad that uh, by the time you've spoken up, aggression after aggression, as mild as it is, as minor as something about being late, if you allow it to repeat and go unaddressed, and then it has an impact on you financially, because this is that kind of thing. I just was determined to not let that happen. So it was like a text message where it was like, eh, you know, I, I did notice this happened. So not a big deal, because it's not. But it would suck if it happened all the time for the reasons I just stated. And uh, our very next session, it was clear that, I, I'll be honest, I felt guilty for having even said that because um, he showed up early, he stayed late. Um, we did have this sort of weird conversation where he said, you know, you, you could benefit. But the thing is, even this was doing me a huge favor. He said, there's, let's turn this into a positive. You come in 15 minutes early and do X, Y, and Z, and then by the time I roll up, you'll have done X, Y, and Z, and we can jump right into phase two of your workout. So you do this stuff we've been doing together by yourself, and then I roll up to the club, the uh, fitness club, and we'll do the rest together. I'm so slow on the draw, I'm going to be honest. I have not been a gym guy. And although I'm as committed to this as you could be committed to anything, it, it, it's like an immersion program in a foreign language. So, for instance, before I could take him up on his advice, I did an audio recording of what these exercises would entail. 
And of course, uh, recording audio in a gym is crazy because you set your phone down as close as you can to where you're trying to record the action. But meanwhile, there's people straining as they're lifting or like thuds as they're dropping those big uh, balls. Just lots of random thuds. And it's a real testament to the power of Pro Tools. These are things that, again, I, I was alluding to earlier, uh, how my studio sort of uh, was ready to go for this podcast because I do voiceover. And these are plugins I got because I'm a voiceover artist, and a lot of them I never had to use before, certainly not on this level. I was doing surgery. I extracted a actionable audio of like a real workout step by step that was just buried under layers and layers and layers and layers of noise. Thank you, Avid and uh, Akon and Waves and uh, uh, Twisted Wave, too. I did some stuff uh, in that app. But then the lateness started again, and this time I didn't mention it because I just really, I was all in at this point. We're only maybe four weeks into the entire process, and I'm thinking, you know, there's going to be ebbs and flows, but there's one day last week where I showed up early. It's very hot out. I feel really shitty that things went bad. I stand by every positive thing I said about uh, this training experience. It uh, was spectacular, but this day came when... Again, health, health. I, I don't have anything super bad. Um, I don't have any kinds of cancer or sexual diseases. Uh, I'm going to be fine. But it's not great for me to be exposed to the heat for long periods of time if I can avoid it. And I'll just just leave it at that. Um, it, it, it's something I can work around, but like I've I've got to be very, very, very protective of time spent in that kind of climate. And this was an example of rolling up early to the gym to do those exercises we had discussed. And then I finished. It's never been the case that I'd finished and he hadn't shown up before. So I I got nervous, and I looked at the time on my iPhone, and it was 8 after. And I just, I, I realized this had become the bad thing I would feared. This had become, as, as hard as I tried, and as much as I feel like I maybe overdid it in trying to prevent this, ultimately, it was that shitty feeling you get when your worst fear about something comes true. And my worst fear here was that this would be a pattern and it would ultimately become destructive and I'd have to say something in a really decisive way and that time had come. So I went downstairs, you know, just said this is unacceptable. And he uh, texted me at that point saying I'm on the train and I showed them the texts and they set me up with the head muckety mucks of the gym training department. And I'm not a, as you might gather from my, discussion about my fitness habits. I am not an imposing guy and I've never had any delusions otherwise. I'm also not a guy who ever felt like having weight to throw around would be an especially good thing, but it becomes more clear to me with time that I'm not a super imposing specimen. I'm uh, about 5'10". I am 140 pounds. And I get away with a lot because I... I pull it off. I pull off the praying mantis thing very well. I accompany it with charisma. I lean in. I know my strengths. But it occasionally becomes very conspicuous to me. I become a little bit self-conscious that uh, my stature is... It means I'm not the dominant one in some rooms. That would include the room in which it was me and the two heads of the personal fitness department at my gym. One man, one woman, and myself. And I'm in there with a head full of steam, and they're calm and rational. And um, thank God, you know, because it occurred to me mid-rant. They were probably amused by me in the same way that, like, if you ever have, say, two dogs, like one's a little purse dog and one's a giant Doberman, 
and it's always the case that the little one barks and barks and barks, and the other dog just sort of nine times out of ten, even if the little dog's actually nipping at them, nine times out of ten, a genuine alpha dog is just just yawns and maybe licks their chops and closes their eyes and wearily ignores it. And um, thankfully, that was the attitude they took toward me. They, uh, and in fact, they were super nice. It wasn't just that they let me vent. They were proactively concerned about my experience. And unfortunately, again, talking about one's worst fears, I uh, had to say, yeah, well, here's the timeline. Here's some texts. And here's the one I got today. And as the conversation went on, I felt worse and worse and guiltier and guiltier. I'm like, you know what? I'm just being a dick. Let me, let me just, this is dumb. This is silly. The, the, this is reparable. And it's now like 35 minutes after the session should have started. And he sends me a text saying, hey, buddy, where are you? And I don't want to write back. I'm in with your boss. So he walks over. There's these big glass doors and we're all sitting in the boss's office. And he sees and he comes in and goes, hey, been wondering where you were. I've been waiting for you since the designated time. And I said, well, you know, that fear of confrontation is now like, like my balls are clenched up into my stomach. I'm, I'm so tense and I, I don't want to have this conversation. I had thought that I was out of the woods because I'd done what I really didn't want to do, but felt I had to. And now thought that my part in this, you know, you know, what I thought was unfair was the idea that if this guy was going to be screwing up, that I'd have to have a direct confrontation with him. And I thought that I had, in going to his bosses, not only drawn attention to the problem, but sidestepped that confrontation because it was uncomfortable and I didn't think I should have to have it. But he's sitting there saying, I've been waiting for you this whole time. And so I very passively, I'm looking down, I'm trying to not make eye contact. And I said, well, I was actually here early. And at that designated time, you weren't there. And he goes, no. I said, well, yeah. So then it got to be eight minutes after. He goes, no, that's, that's not true. You're lying. And again, it goes back to two things co-joined. One is that I don't have an appetite or tolerance for violence. When I get angry, that's not where I've ever gone. The acts of violence in my life, which I could count on one hand, have always been to defend myself when like my safety, usually life, was in jeopardy. I have been quick to snap audibly at times and regret it, but um, I didn't do that here. Again, I don't like that. And again, the intimidation scale is crazy. Three superhumans and I in a room together. The balance of power is quite askew. And they took him out of the room. When he was gone, it was just me and the woman. And I did say to her, I, I was really happy to be able to articulate what was going on. I said, you know, up until that moment, I was feeling nothing but guilt and shame for coming in so hot and being this worked up about it and about making a thing of it to begin with. But... For him to have made that assertion that I was lying, forgetting that it's offensive, it was untrue. It was patently untrue. And it, it meant that, sadly, every worst instinct I had from the get-go, every pessimistic, shitty idea that I got that one day he was 10 minutes late, that really was an overreaction, if analyzed externally without any of the facts that followed, all these shitty thoughts were true. They were right. They were accurate and a little shittier besides. So that really bummed me out a lot. But again, the worse things got directly with me and this guy, the better his bosses were. I don't know that they were presuming one person was telling the truth and another was not. I've got to think in the case of this trainer, there's very little likelihood that behavior this weird, this is the first time and I'm the only person. But again, and I... I asked this, I said, please, I know he said that and it was really upsetting and I'm really upset, but uh, please promise me that to the extent possible, what happened with me and this guy doesn't affect his career. More than confrontation, the idea at night when I go to bed, the thought that something I've said or done could impact somebody's livelihood. I've suffered a lot to avoid that because I just think that's the shittiest thing in the world. 
I think that's bad karma. I think that's to be prevented at all costs. I know that in this day and age, sometimes with social media, people can get very upset and people with differing views go after each other and try and shut each other down. And look, if you're a corporation that's putting out hate speech and people are targeting your advertisers, that's a very different issue than what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like there's a doorman in my building or there was where I live who was terrible antisocial and rude and like genuinely mean. And for two years, I just didn't say anything about it because a complaint from a tenant would blow up this guy's whole deal. And it's not going to make him a better person. And the guilt from that honestly supersedes any pleasure or satisfaction I would get out of not being treated crummy. Again, I just, I want to have a positive impact on the world around me. I figure you put out good and you get good back in return. In this case, ultimately, it was for the good. I've started with my new trainer. He's fantastic. I think I'm going to continue my path to being super healthy and super ripped and just having a great time of things. I would have preferred a smoother ride, obviously. But you deal with it and uh, you move on. And speaking of moving on, this was a very preliminary first episode of the Matt Sager podcast, and I hope you loved it. Next time, I'm going to try and get a co-host with me. Uh, And as I said, I really, really, really want contributors. Be you voice actors, comedians, writers, specialists in any field, and you've got something you want to plug and be a guest. I want this to be collaborative and not the uh, solo confessional that it's been. Although this has been lots of fun, I hope you stick around for the ride. Uh, So follow me on Twitter, at Matt Sager. Facebook is Matt Sager VO. Email me, matt at mattsager.com. Website is mattsager.com. And actually, the one I'm more active on these days is mattsagervoiceover.com. Have a great week.